Okay, here we go. Here's our beautiful region. So when I showed this picture in Germany uh, last summer, nobody in the audience had any trouble telling me what the climate-related hazards that we would have in the region would be, as well as what kind of natural hazards we'd have. So I think starting with the idea that the region is a really important perspective when we talk about risk, especially climate-related risk. And recently, last week, uh, there was a report that rated Vancouver the second most resilient city in the world. Um, but we're in the lowest 10 when it comes to uh, climate-related hazards such as sea level rise. So uh, this is very similar to one of the themes Ken talked about. And certainly, just reflecting on three years at the city talking and working in climate adaptation, it's, it's been a really new field. And it's, it's looking at climate-related hazards uh, and tends to be planners and policy staff looking at preparedness and adaptive capacity. But we've got this great body of work in disaster risk reduction um, that we're, we're starting to learn from. And, all, and these two fields are definitely starting to converge. Uh, it tends to be disaster risk reduction, tends to be in the emergency management department, you know, way out at uh, ECOM, uh, and certainly in historically has been more traditionally um, emergency response staff and emergency response focused. And then when I asked the working group that I was working with at the city, if we were adapted to climate change in Vancouver, what, what would it look like? And everyone's answer is, well, we'd still be livable, amazing Vancouver, uh, and we'd bounce back from, from all the shocks that happened. So basically resilience, right? The, the concept of resilience. So I think there's a lot of overlap. When we look at the Greenest City Action Plan in Vancouver, a lot of the actions under sustainability help us prepare for climate change as well. So planting trees, stormwater management, conserving water, all these things help us move forward. So there's a lot of integration. Planning for sea level rise. These are some 3Ds of eight meters of sea level rise. So beyond what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying for even uh, 2300. So they're just an interesting perspective. There's Granville Island. There's Science World at the back with Olympic Village on the right. So this is really an emerging hazard, uh, sea level rise. We don't have a defined floodplain in Vancouver. They're, the province never defined a floodplain in Vancouver. So now there's this idea that there could be a floodplain in certain areas due to coastal flooding. So we have this increasing risk, but we have no cost indicator of this risk because there's no flood insurance uh, in Canada, no residential flood insurance. Uh, this is also a challenge because there's uncertain timelines. We don't know when we're going to suddenly overtop the seawall, and we don't know how much by. There are projections, definitely. So I'm just going to walk through quickly what we're doing in terms of our coastal flood risk assessment, so what we're looking at uh, in preparation for sea level rise. So we're answering these four questions, which are common in a risk assessment. So what are the primary hazards? Who and what are vulnerable? What consequences can we expect? and how can we mitigate the risk? So looking at hazard, what's the primary hazard? So given that we're looking way out in the future and we have some uncertainty, we did some scenario modeling. So we looked at five scenarios of the hazard and they differed in terms of how much sea level rise we were including, the timeline, so we modeled some to 2100 and some to 2200, as well as the likelihood, so some to a 1 in 500 return event, one to some uh, 1 in 10,000 year event. So here's an example of the extent, the extent of flooding that you could expect in the year 2100 with one meter of flooding and a 1 in 500 year event. So those are the areas basically that we would call a floodplain, and we'd, uh, we need to react and look at changing uh, the way we develop in those areas. So then we're looking at who and what are vulnerable to the hazards. So uh, we got a cross-section group together, um, got Vancouver School Board, uh, the telecommunications, BC Hydro, starting to look at what's in the way of the water. So this is just a quick high-level hotspot map. Uh, this one's on community uh, social services. So the red and the concentration of the red are where there's a high, a high concentration of those services in an area that would be flooded uh, in the year 2100. And then we're looking at consequences. What can we expect from a flood of this size? Uh, and we're looking at uh, amount of people displaced, how many people would need shelter, the damage, the cost, the economic loss. And of course, we have to look at uh, 
population projections and uh, density projections to do this. And then moving from knowledge to action, how do we increase our resilience to this hazard, to flooding? And we have to think about that both from the physical infrastructure point of view, but also from the social resilience point of view. So what are some of the menu of options? We've got those non-structural options. So do we create a sea level rise planning area and start to retreat or change use over time? Uh, do we change our large site rezoning policy and include stipulations to increase uh, the whole site, increase the roads on the site as well. Uh, we can do emergency plans for buildings, as New York has done, look at water valves on the main floors, the more emergency uh, responses. And then structurally, we've increased the elevation of the main floor of all the buildings in those flood extent areas by one meter, looking at construction methods. And then, of course, um, there's a lot of conversation about dikes and big storm surge gates under the Burrard Street Bridge, and then the soft infrastructure like wetland res restoration and park planning. And then looking at increasing stakeholder and community awareness, communicating about risk, and increasing community connections. So I think resilience at the city is really becoming the new silo buster. Um, it's, it's really becoming the new way of integrating. We've, we've got so many projects on the go that are, are really have the goal of increasing resilience. So obviously, post Sandy, everybody's heard this. One third of, of those affected reached out to their friends, family, and neighbors, and that was 50% in the affected areas. So looking at the projects that are underway, we have the sharing economy, and that's under the sustainability plan, under the Greenest City Action Plan. Uh, so we're tr that's aiming at um, overconsumption. We've got healthy city strategy. One of the main goals is cultivating connections and having a target of everybody knowing four people that they can rely on in time of need. We've got the Mayor's Engaged City Task Force and one of the three priority areas there is to increase relationships between neighbours. And then in emergency management we have the community disaster support hubs, so trying to create a, a space in each community where people go to build their skills about disaster response and recovery. So some of the challenges um, that we've faced in planning for sea level rise already is certainly choosing a risk tolerance level. So where is the balance between um, flooding and cost of protection? How do we communicate risk? The map that I put up there includes a lot of existing and, and new buildings. How do you communicate that this is a floodplain in the year 2100 and will work towards um, mitigating the risk? There's a lot of implications to zoning and design when you think about uh, putting a building up a meter higher on one side of the street than the existing neighborhood in small infill areas like Kitts Point. Uh, how do you not affect your neighbors? How do you still get two stories? There's some interesting questions. Uh, so really a wicked problem. Uh, into the future, I think uh, there's a move to start basing decisions more on risk. So instead of just on a standard, like a 1 in 100 floodplain as they did in Calgary, base it on where, what's the likelihood of the event and what's the consequence. So are we okay with Kitts pool flooding once every three years? What about if we have the Olympic Village flooding one every 20 years? We need to consider the tolerance. I think we're moving towards better risk assessment methodology regionally. There's a lot of discussion about that. Uh, interestingly, I think if I could go back and start this again, start with clearer needs and policy goals to then uh, run the risk assessment. You can go to any level of detail on a risk assessment that you want, really. Uh, a better link to land use and development planning, certainly, and to, I think, other hazards, earthquake hazards. Is there a way to retrofit a building seismically and for flood resilience? and at the same time improve energy efficiency? Not sure. Uh, I think we need to build our skills in communicating and sharing risk information. Uh, certainly, North Van is, is at the leading edge of that internationally. And collaborate regionally. We've had some ad hoc groups form. We have a Burrard Inlet Collaborative that meets to talk about flood construction levels and um, sea level rise, and now uh, through the work that some of us have been doing over the last two years. The Fraser Basin Council has now 
uh, coordinated a regional risk management group that's working towards a regional risk assessment. That's it, thank you.